Welcome, folks. We are here with Piano with Johnny. I have two founders, Johnny May and Yannick Lambrecht. These are some of our preferred member dev clients. We've worked with them for several years, and today they're honoring us by doing a case study. They're actually honoring themselves as well. Um, the impetus for this is to record a nice and fairly comprehensive comprehensive session that kind of tells the PWJ story. And so we're going to go back all the way to its infancy or its conception, which they're going to speak to here in a second. And then we're going to also dig into some other stuff like where the business is today, eight years, eight years later, um, some of the challenges and insights that they've faced along the way. And then anywhere else that this takes us. So we were just discussing before we hopped on and hit record that we want this to be a very casual conversation and we want to tell a real story. You know, there's a lot of people out there who, who uh, talk about building membership sites, building online businesses, but they don't always share some of the details. And so that's the aim here is that we just want to give people some perspective into what it's really like. So first and foremost, thank you both for jumping on and hitting record with us. Um, who would like to give a quick background on PWJ? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in. So um, Ali, thank you for having us. We're so thrilled to be here with your, your audience and we're glad to uh, share our journey. And we know you have a lot of entrepreneurs watching and people who aspire to start a, a business like ours. So uh, hopefully some of the things that we'll share today will be um, helpful to them. So uh, yeah, we're Piano with Johnny and we are an online piano education platform. Uh, you can think of us like a Netflix for the piano. So go to Piano with Johnny, uh, you log in, and you have instant access to over 200 uh, piano courses, um, teaching primarily uh, styles of piano, improvisation, songs. Um, so when you go to Piano with Johnny, you'll learn things like jazz and blues, and you'll learn Latin piano and funk, and you'll read how to learn how to read lead sheets. Um, that's kind of what we focus on currently. Um, and then we also offer a lot of live events. We do monthly live Q and A's with our members. We do uh, monthly workshop lessons, which is basically a live lesson. Um, we do uh, student collaborations where the students can play with me. And then every month we publish a video and we do student recitals. Um, we have Q and A submissions for students who cannot attend our regular Q and A's. Um, and, and we're always at, trying to add new events for our students. So you can think of us like a course platform like a Netflix, Netflix, but then we're also like a school where um, there's a lot of interactive things to do uh, with us. 100%. What would you add to that, Yannick, if anything? Yeah, we do all things piano. You know, we're both, Johnny and I are wildly passionate about piano education. And I'll actually share a little bit about how the business started, if I may. So I also got my degree in music from Chapman University, and I was a singer there. And uh, kind of a late starter on the piano and so when i met johnny it was through my girlfriend at the time who's johnny's sister and so johnny i you know we got married so johnny's actually my brother-in-law mm -hmm. but i just remember hearing johnny play for the first time and i was so by his talent and you know he's played at disneyland for years um just could play any song in any style and i thought how how do you do that like how is that possible because i'd never met someone who had that talent and so selfishly i thought i want to learn that mm -hmm. and surely there must be other people who want to be able to do that too so i had kind of a background in uh, video production i kind of did that as a hobby on the side and so i approached johnny one day and i thought hey like what if we recorded some lessons and this was like in the early days of youtube when people just started uploading lessons and thought wow there's an interesting opportunity here so let's just record some performances and some lessons and see if people watch. And um, I didn't have like an extensive business background. For me, it was, you know, reading books and also kind of growing up uh, in a family where my father started his own business and kind of always encouraged me to be a self-starter and to pursue things that excited and interested me. So Johnny was on board launched our business in 2012 with just three courses and a couple of videos on YouTube. And yeah, that's how we got started. This is amazing because I'm actually learning things I didn't know about you guys, even though I know you fairly well. So did you nudge Johnny to start this business? 
Well, I think Johnny can speak to that. He was in high demand as a teacher at the time. So I think that was part of the impetus for him to say yes. Yeah, Yannick, Yannick was the one, I, I actually remember the day we were going on a double date with my now wife, who was my girlfriend, I think at the time, or no, maybe we were married. But Yannick was like, hey, let's start this. Let's record your piano lessons. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? You're crazy. <laughs> Um, and yeah, at the time, I, um, I was a gigging musician, so my background is I'm classically trained um, and went on as a teenager to study jazz. I studied with the Disneyland pianist uh, Johnny Hodges um, for four years as a teenager, and then I also studied jazz with uh, Larry Flayhive, who was an amazing teacher, and basically started gigging as a teenager and then landed the job as the Disneyland Ragtime Pianist. And so I did that for nine years and I also played in like different wedding bands and I was, I was just doing a ton of gigging. I was probably playing seven days a week at various restaurants and, um, and but I was also teaching private piano and I had probably 25 students who would come to me. And um, I remember I, I was actually turning down students because I just didn't have the room in my schedule. So when Yana came to me and said, hey, let's record some of your courses, it was actually really nice for me to be able to have something that I could give to students who couldn't actually attend a real lesson. Mm -hmm. Totally. You know what else is interesting about uh, hearing you guys recite your story is that, so let's, let's back into the dates. What was the actual year? It was 2012 or 13? When well, the idea came, yeah, the idea came about in like 2010 or 11. And then when we actually launched our first website, that was 2012. Okay, cool. So the reason I think that's important to just uh, talk about for a bit is that a big thing with business in general, and one of the things that we coach people on, especially when they're new, when they're coming in fresh, like you were in 2012, is that timing is actually important. And the, what I mean by that is, is not like you making time to do it, but the time that you're trying to bring something to market. And you guys... This is actually, let's see, 2013, 2012, 2013 was pretty, you know, this is an advance because I want to give another example of when I timed something that was well, but failed to execute when one of my business partners and I, Kyle, who, work, who works with me, a member of, we launched an online yoga site. And this was a few years after you. It was good timing because at that point, I think it was like 2014 maybe 15, like online yoga was still kind of new. And so when you guys did this, whether you, you probably realize this as, as Yannick shaking his head, like you were coming in when the world was starting to get used to this. Like, cause if you would have came in at 2008, they'd be like, we don't know what this is. What do you mean online piano? If you would come in now, be like, Hey, welcome to the party. You got a lot of catching up to do. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so you were, you fell in at the, at the right time, which I think is awesome. And it's also something to share with people. It's like, don't, or I won't say don't, but you have a different game to play if you mistime something. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that being said, I feel like now it's not like the ship has sailed by any means. Like right. now that I would, if, if anything, now the barriers to entry are lower because there's so many ways, like it's easier to get started now to create a website, to, totally. you know, record yourself, to edit. So yeah, there's still lots of you know great opportunities out there in many different markets very well said very well said okay so thank you for that we have we have a cool story how you got started we'll move on to talk a little bit about where the business is today so eight years later i'm just going to give the summary and then let you guys talk and share on what you want so today you've got almost 10,000 members and growing. So you're starting to establish critical mass or at least what small businesses hope to achieve in terms of critical mass. You have 162,000 YouTube subscribers and you are a seven figure business. We're not going to talk about how much money you generate because exactly, because that's not important, but we do want to share with your audience that you're at that level. And we also know, I know from you personally that that's not your driver. So you guys don't just look at revenue and profit, et cetera, but I think it's helpful to share with, with the audience that this is where you're at. This is what you're operating at. So in, after summarizing that, let's have a fun conversation maybe and it kicks off at like, what's different today than back in 2012? <laughs> and who wants to go first <laughs> as your eyes perk up? <laughs> oh my goodness. 
Uh, I'd say almost everything except for us. <laughs> we're we're. Uh, well, that's a that's an interesting comment. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, we've um, we've changed. We're still here, but we've had to change a lot um, in our thinking. Um, and then obviously, there's like the real the real life thing. Real life, you know, actually like creating the courses. I mean, if you look at our first courses, it we actually have a, a really funny picture of us at Chapman University, Yonick's alma mater, and we're in a practice room uh, recording this course. We'd never done it. But Yonick's friend, we'd hired to do the video, and he's up on uh, two chairs with like a tripod super awkwardly above me. I've got my shoulders like tucked in like this because the tripod legs are like this. And I'm trying to teach and it was like, but we pulled it off. Like we actually did that. And now we, we just have a really nice setup where we can record new courses pretty quickly. Um, you know, the website, obviously it looks so much better. I remember our first website, it was just like tons of text. And then we had like three little courses and now we've got this wonderful offering. Um, and I would say one of the biggest things is we have a team now, which is really cool. I mean, when we started, Yannick and I really bootstrapped the business. So Yannick learned video editing and like we really had to do everything ourselves. And now we're at a, obviously a place where we can actually hire really talented people. So we've got a great community manager, um, Katie Rushing, who also helps with our content. Uh, we have three blog writers now who write blogs. We've got a video, editor, our graphics editor, we've got someone who guy helps with, with our Facebook ads, YouTube ads. So, um, and then we are now starting to bring on teachers in the platform, which is really exciting to feature other talent. Totally. Yeah. What about, did you have any to add to that, Yannick? Otherwise I have. Yeah. Just, just looking back, it's fun to see how in the beginning, you know, like it's, everything is iterative. So yeah, in the beginning we were just going for something that was good enough you know it certainly wasn't perfect like johnny said but it was good enough to you know put it on a website and offer it to people and i think it gave us sort of you know an ex uh, like it helped us overcome the excuses not to start because i think a lot of people have that in the beginning like oh my my setup isn't nice enough like you know i need to have this really high quality course or product before i you know invite people to try it out and that's been actually uh, the opposite of what we've done. You know, we've just tried to create something that was good enough, put it out there. And so much of the process over the last eight years has been learning from our users and talking to them and really building relationships with sort of a core group of members. I mean, we love all of our members, but we've really connected with people who are passionate about what we're doing mm -hmm. and taking all that feedback in the form of surveys and just trial offerings, you know, live lessons, workshops, Q and A's, and gather this feedback to improve what we do as a platform. So, and, and the business has certainly evolved as well in terms of our offerings. Like we started out as just an e-commerce business selling digital products. Then in 2015, we launched our first membership. Mm -hmm. And so that was our first sort of shift. And we had the two side by side. So we had our digital products, sheet music, downloadable video courses. And then in 2015, we said, you want access to everything, join our membership. And then this is an interesting segue because then we met you when we wanted to do our, uh, our third website, right? The first two, we just kind of, you know, tried to put together ourselves with a little bit of help. But our third redesign was when we really got methodical and, and deliberate about how we wanted to change the, the user experience how we wanted to organize our content and how we wanted to guide our students to be as successful as they could be with our platform. Because everybody knows that you can find so much content online. It's, we're, we're all drowning in content, right? So now it's, it's more of a question of how can you create a really engaging, dynamic user experience so that people are successful with what you're offering. Mm -hmm. So... In that sense, I feel like we've really evolved and we're continuing to evolve and figure out what's the next thing that we can do to help our students be more successful. Yeah, I've always, I've always sensed that from you guys. I, correct me if I'm wrong, haven't you hired some of your members who are now team members? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's so awesome on various levels, but it's such an organic way because it's an organic way to hire and grow your team because you you basically already check the cultural fit. You're like, oh, if you dig our content and you've been, you've been a loyal member, like 
you're probably going to fit in here. Is that how you guys think about it? 100%. And talented people are talented people. Like you bring in good people, they can learn any aspect of the business. And so to me, yeah, it's been finding people who love the platform, they're familiar with the platform, um, and they, they believe in our vision and they love what we're doing. And so far we've found wonderful people. And I'm, I'm a huge fan for all of your, you know, uh, people watching who are interested in doing something that we've done, you know, hire within, you'll get the best, most passionate um, employees. Totally. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yes. And so what you segued in, there's a, there's a, a bunch of different things I want to discuss here, but I'm trying to stay focused in that. And also uh, some things that I learned working with you all. So I'm going to tee up a little bit of the context on um, member devs relationship with you and then my relationship with you. So we met back in 2017. So as you, as you mentioned, Yannick, this is when you were on your, the second iteration of your site, you were ready to jump into the third iteration. You know, we spent a couple months to my recollection, like, we did a quick audit for you, which I executed to kind of say like, okay, where's your site at? Came back with some recommendations and then got to a proposal for you to do a project with us. And I'll let you speak. To, well, I want to talk a little bit about this because like it's, if you fast forward now, almost four years later, um, we are still very involved in helping you as a technical partner. We spent some time last year doing a more in-depth strategy coaching relationship, which was awesome for me. I, I assume, you got some value out of that as well. And it's a, it, there's, there's a lot of interesting things I've learned from you guys, which I want to honor. You know, we, we have a, a great relationship and we all, you know, I feel like I've, I hope I've expressed that I appreciate you guys, but it's funny because a lot of people ask about your site. Um, and <laughs> that wasn't the reason to record this primarily, but your name comes up a lot. Like there's, there'll be times where people inquire with us and they're like, just like piano with Johnny. I'm like, wait a second. What do you mean? Just like piano with Johnny. And they've like, so you may, by the way, have some people who create test law test accounts on your site. Cause they're evaluating if, if they want to do, if they want to work with member dev. So just a heads up there. But the other thing that was really interesting that I share about your project. And again, I, I want to share this from a place of learning is that, when we started your project, like, like most projects of that size, you know, we estimated maybe like a six month timeline, something of that nature. And I know we took, we took over a year, not a lot over a year, but I think just about over a year. So, and, and there was definitely some times in the project where there was a little bit of friction from either side, like, Hey, where are we at? Can we get this back on track, et cetera. And mostly because we had this concept of a schedule in our head, right? A schedule, is arguably one of the hardest things for a company like member dev to manage because there's a lot of human factors that come into play for clients, for our own team. Like how do we keep progress, especially on larger projects? Um, why I'm teeing that up is that in hindsight, even though you could, you could argue that we drastically blew the schedule, it was also one of the most successful projects we've done. And this goes back to some of Yannick's comments that he just set made that I saw in reflection, I remember, thinking about that. And even now, you know, this comes to mind whenever we, we talk about projects at your level, like I tell people this, these projects launch when they want to launch. So for example, there were times where like you all needed more time to pause and think about like, Hey, we need to sit with this, the user experience of this dashboard. Like we might need, we want to really talk about this, do some internal iterations and then come back to you. And then vice versa, there'd be times where we would be deep in the development of something and then come back to you like, Hey, we thought about this. We need to, re we need to take a different approach. And um, had we maintained a six month schedule, which there are times where we do this, we wouldn't have been able to make those decisions. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I thought when Yannick said that it reinforces the thoughts I've had, which again, were huge takeaways from your project that like, there is a, how do I phrase this? There is these projects will launch when they're ready to launch. And like, we can kind of push them to, but you aren't the only example where I've seen like, oh, even though this took longer, the outcome is actually better. And so I want to digress. Did you guys feel any of that? Like kind of looking back in hindsight? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. It took a lot, <laughs> a lot longer than I thought. I was like, let's get this <laughs> website up, like fast, fast, fast. And then I was like, oh, man, this is a lot of work. And we, Yannick and I internally had to repurpose a lot of the content for the new website. And it just took a really long time. But, you know, I'm so grateful we did that because it's better to go slowly and have the right product, especially when you're looking at a website that you might have for you know, five years. Right. Um, in fact, the, the two previous versions, it, ha it had been about three years since those. So it's a major endeavor and it's so important to get it right for the customer. You know, you have to, as an entrepreneur, put yourself in the shoes of your customer, your student, mm -hmm. and walk through those pages and, and walk through the logic and go, is this serving them? Mm -hmm. So you have to have a ton of empathy, I think, to build a great website and it'd be very flexible. And, but I'm so grateful that it turned out the way it did. And it's not perfect. There's still new things, but we got the main things that we wanted. And also to Yannick's point, it's good enough. And, you know, it's like, you can always do more. You can always perfect it. And you literally these things, you know, scope creep is a term we use in business where it just keeps getting bigger. And so you really helped us with that as well, Ovi. Something I appreciated working with you is you really helped say, okay, what matters the most here for the students? So. Um, and then Yannick, another thought that came to mind is something you told me recently, which just really resonated. You said, um, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Mm, yeah. And yeah, and that I one love, came from, I'll go ahead. Oh, I just love that concept that, you know, we can think it's actually taking really long time, but actually we're going as fast as we can to get what actually what we want. So that that's, I think, a model Yannick and I um, tend to operate more in that speed so go ahead Jan. yeah go ahead yeah it's a it's a saying that uh, came from a navy seal i picked it up from uh tim ferris's podcast but yeah we're we're very methodical in our decisions and we really take our time to consider all the angles like johnny was saying like even in our decision of whether or not to work with you you know we were looking at different developers and checking out their work and getting quotes and Generally for us, I think we like the middle road, you know, where something is not like someone is like, oh, I can, yeah, I can take care of that. No problem. It's going to be easy. I'll get it done versus, you know, someone who's like very high level, like enterprise, and it's going to cost six figures to build a website. You were sort of that bright middle ground where it was a stretch for us. And Johnny and, and I, in fact, like we had to sit down and take out a loan to do our project with you. But I mean, hey, look, at the end of when we launched the website, it paid itself back fivefold, right? So it was a worthwhile investment for us. And, and it took the time that it took. And um, just like you learned a lot in working with us, like we learned so much in that process too. Um, we were really trying to educate ourselves in that process on all the best. It's, we were reading, you know, Donald Miller's book, uh, The Story Brand. You know, your, your customer is the hero, you're not the hero really speak to their, you know, their, their pain points, uh, like Johnny was saying, empathy, you know, like genuinely empathize with your customers. And we're musicians, so of course we can empathize with our customers, you know? Um, and so, yeah, just everything, well, not everything, but a lot of things take longer than you expect them to. And, and we had to make some very big decisions and there was kind of a, a leap of faith in some of those decisions, which ended up working out. And we trusted your experience, Ali, because you've worked with, you know, so many different websites and you understand uh, all the components that go into it. So we really relied on your advice um, for some of those bigger decisions, not to overcomplicate things um, that didn't need to be complicated. You know, we wanted to do like a credit system for our downloads, yes, which remember. ended up being like adding a lot of scope. And we've said, you know what, let's just <laughs> offer those downloads. Um, you know, we can, we can en encourage people to um, make the most of our platform without having to, you know, gate content excessively. So yeah, it was a great learning experience all around. That, so that piece is is worth talking about because uh, people who watch member of content or have discussions with me ha at this point know my philosophy on complexity. It's actually something that stays on my whiteboard. How could this be simpler? And it, the reason that's on my whiteboard, the reason that I talk about this, and I appreciate you bringing that up, Yannick, is that as a dev as like my core competency is software engineering. So like 
when I'm in flow state, I'm unbothered just writing code and solving problems. Just like as a kid, I grew up, I loved to build things and, and mess with puzzles. I actually just beat, I don't know if I shared this with you guys, I just beat a video game. It's the first video game I bought in a decade. And it was so fun to kind of relive that as a kid and also have my five-year-old son Everest kind of watch and cheer me on. And nice. where this, there's this thing called complexity that comes up in business. And as an engineer, it's really easy for me to embrace it, even accommodate it. Because you can imagine like you've got people, you've got businesses, you know, smart entrepreneurs just like you. They're like, yo, this is what we want to do. We want to do this. It needs to do this and this. And then so as an engineer, you're like, great, give me all the inputs. I'll start turning the gears and I'll figure out how to do it for you. And it's um, more often than not, if you just like a, a native engineer is going to take on complexity and then spit out more complexity, but here's what I did and not necessarily communicate how it works or, and think long-term like, well, no, I did edit all these things because it needs to work if you scale, et cetera, et cetera. When in, and so for many years, that's how I operated. And I realized I'm still realizing, I'm still learning and mastering this, is that like, there's always a simpler way. There's always a simpler way, right? And I see you guys nodding your head. It, and if you were usually for some reason scared to take the simpler way, or we think that it's inferior, when in reality, as I, like even my wife and I, we're embracing minimalism. Like we're trying to simplify across the board in every way. And I continue to enjoy it. It just continues to fulfill me more to be like simpler less, mm -hmm. simpler, less. And so I, again, the, uh, uh, how this really relates back to your project and just continue to work with you guys is like, I appreciate that you take time. I actually appreciate that you look at things from different angles and then you might spend a little bit more time with it because when you move quickly and there is a time to move quickly, like startups don't have the, they can't afford this. Like, let's think about things and take it slow. Like a lot of times they have to get going and there's good reason for that. But like, I can appreciate that now because it, it's just, the easy, I, I want to use the word easier. It's an easier way of living. It's an easier way of doing business being like, Hey, let's think about this, not to overthink it. Right. But let's think about this in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. And then can we make this simpler? Like I ask myself that a lot. So uh, do you guys look at that with your business and even your team members? And as you start to grow into new areas, do you seek out ways to make things simpler or have you also ca caught yourself in that trap of being like, ah, oh, we're into the complexity again? It's something I have to think about every time I sit and make a piano course. My goodness, you know, I can explain it the hard way or the easy way. So I yeah, think. I mean, I think, I think the winners in life are the ones, uh, you know, I think a lot of us are not that creative. We're just regurgitating information <laughs> in just the most efficient and simple way. Right. Um, I've always told students, I don't feel like I'm really inventing anything at the piano. I'm teaching things that have come way before me, but I think my skill as a teacher is distilling the important information from that and in presenting it. So yeah, the same goes in business. I think um, those who present, and there's all kinds of quotes about this, but those who, who make it just really easy are the ones who will win the customers. So yeah, I think it... Uh, it hits me, I think, a lot. I think it's easy, I think, in every conversation to, to blow things up a lot bigger than they really are. And that's a great um, thing, having a business partner, actually, in Yannick, is he's, he's able to sort of counter that for me, and I feel like I can do the same for him. So it's been wonderful to have a team to bounce ideas off of, and I think there's a lot of humility in our team. We have an idea, you know, we push back, and then there's, there's no egos. So the best, the best idea wins. So... Yeah, that's, that's something I do recommend for everyone who's listening to this is um, find really good people and listen to their ideas and push back because you'll be amazed what you'll come up with collaboratively. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I would say, to, uh, I think you're about to speak to this, so sorry to cut you off. But Yannick, I know that because you've handled a lot of like the ops side of the business, I'm curious on how you control that because there's even i've seen it i've helped you tackle problems we're like hey which of these tools should we make do what and how so what, what's your piece on that yeah it it always starts with doing the research like knowing what 
components can solve the problem that you're trying to solve. For example, as your membership grows, your customer support tickets grow, right? So how do you manage that? Like, do you keep just hiring more customer support people or do you try to come up with a, a better solution and one that can simplify the problem, right? So we started really categorizing, like what are our recurring questions that we get every single day? And how can we, how can we help our, our customers to resolve these problems? And so getting a knowledge base was one of the best things that we did last year. It was something that you encouraged us to do, Ali, and, and set up with uh, Freshdesk. You know, and there's different platforms. Zendesk has a knowledge base option as well, and there's other platforms. But just thinking through your problems, instead of like there's, there's a challenge where you just get used to certain problems, yep. and then you get used to your workaround. Right. And it's like, well, this is how we've always done it. Yeah. Right. But there's all like Johnny and I talk about this idea that goes around in lots of circles. It's Kaizen. It's a Japanese term that means small, continuous improvements. Mm -hmm. So trying not to get used to an inefficient or complicated way of doing things and just asking the question, is there an easier way to do this and a better way long term? And like Johnny said, talking to people who are smarter than you, you know, having conversations with you, Ali, and Johnny's also part of a couple of groups um, that I've been to as well, entrepreneur organization. Mm -hmm. um, we were also fortunate to be part of the uh, in business incubator program at Cal State Fullerton when Johnny was a student there. So we've been very fortunate to to be around people who think in this way because let's face it, it's not something that comes naturally to to all of us. I would agree. No, I would definitely agree. I think that, well, you said a few things there, but it's one like surrounding yourself with people that you can, you know, continue to learn from, I think is essential. And also they're like, when you look at, you said the term, well, we've always done it this way, which is a dangerous term and it, it can go both ways. Right. Because there's way there's, there's the, the saying, you know, the cliche saying, if it's not broke, don't fix it, which is, which can be generally true. Like if something works, then optimize it until it doesn't work. Like that's a, a very foundational business principle. But then there's the, we've always done it this way. Um, that lends to, or could lend to stubbornness and not being persuadable. And that's actually something where I've spent a lot of energy the last at least 12 months with one of my business partners on just like being persuadable, you know, and, and not persuadable to where you become indecisive, but like true, because I don't think many people can do this well, where you truly can see different perspectives and, and like listen to them and see them through. And that's what I think Johnny was talking about when he's referencing like, Hey, hire great people, listen to them, you know, give them responsibility, which I totally agree with. It's like, it's one thing to say, yeah, I, I hear you guys, but then in your mind, you're still just thinking on the one solution that you think is the best. Mm -hmm. Whereas being persuadable to me is like when you truly get to a state where you're like, hmm, Yannick just said something really interesting that I hadn't considered. It completely contradicts the way I would do it. And I'm willing to consider that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's a right. mindset shift. And it, it took me a while to get there because I come from like, you know, stubborn Persian origin where like, you know, this is how we've done it. So like, we're going to keep doing that way. Whereas like, and again, you don't want to go so far in the spectrum where you're like, well, is there a better way on every single thing? But I think it's, I just want to emphasize what you said is that it's important to be persuadable, you know? Hmm. I like that. That's great. Yeah. This kicks into the next thing we want to talk about and, and spend some time really sharing insights, learning. And, you know, I have some notes here just to help us spark ideas, but I actually want you guys to organically speak to this. Um, we, you know, to, to repaint the picture, the people that are probably listening to this are entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, people who want to, who are creators like you guys, like that's, what's so cool about your story. You're both creators. And um, there's this piece of building membership sites, online subscription sites, online businesses that, it, you know, you will find a lot of this online, like in learning and, and seeking education, like follow your passion and then turn to business. And there's a lot of truth to that, but it's also not that easy, right? You can't just say, because I like doing this, all of a sudden people will pay me money. Um, you guys have, this is where, again, I want to get into your insights is like, where, 
I think a good starting point, like before we, we talk at depth of like marketing and specific strategies is like, what were some of the basic systems because that you put in place and you may not have even realized it was a system in the early days. Whereas now you probably have more clarity around systems with the level of business you're at. But I think this is, is a really essential thing to discuss because when I was a, an early entrepreneur, I lacked systems. It was all in my head. I just did, and I did well, but it was all about me. And even today, if there's a place that I'm, that I, I'm continually improving, it's thinking about systems and more importantly, um, implementing systems, right? I actually can think about systems fairly well. It's that putting them in place and especially putting them in a, in a way that other people can can contribute and execute. So how do you guys think about that as you, as you start? And again, take this wherever you want, but I th think that's a, a nice entry point is like what systems are in place and how they allowed you to learn, et cetera. I let you speak to this, Yannick. I feel like you're thinking more about systems than I am. Yeah, I think I can relate to you, Ali. Like when it was just Johnny and me, like a lot of the systems were up in my head and we each kind of took responsibility for our own things that we did. I did most of the website management. Johnny did most of the content creation. Um, and on an additional team member, now we had to communicate that and figure out how to delegate efficiently. So just writing down our standard operating procedures for how we manage our content. And there's a lot of steps, of course, in creating content, right? You have to come up with the idea, right? You have to create, in our case, sheet music for it. Then you have to shoot the lesson. That's all in Johnny's domain. Once he's done with that, then we have to, you know, do the post-production work, um, add some titles, make it look nice, upload it to the website, publish it on all the different channels. We also add chapter markers. We host our videos on Wistia. And so they have a nice chapter marker feature so that people can navigate through the content easily. So, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts and it's easy to miss little steps. So we're a big fan of checklists. You know, ClickUp is a, a program that I know you're using now as well, Ali. Mm -hmm. It's great for internal communication and assigning tasks and deadlines. And for graphics guy, we've got um, Katie, our content manager, who announces all the new content in our communities online. So there's a lot of steps and we've used templates to just make it as um, as foolproof as possible that we're not going to make too many errors because it's all it's always more work when you have to go back like oh we published that course and now we missed that error right. we have to go back so is the yeah. system for like, like let's just use this this is awesome let's use like creating a course or even a lesson because that's a more modular unit for you so let's there's hundreds of, of piano lessons online on pianojourney.com. But what's, what'll be cool to unpack is like the way that a lesson comes to life now from the second it started to the second it's actually published in the site. How different is that system from the early days? Or is it even that different? Like, did you guys nail this from the beginning? <laughs> no, it's like completely different okay good that's what i want to hear like the brief yeah. sure yeah um i mean when we when we started uh so we were we had a friend of ours recording the video and then he i mean yannick you can speak to this whole process but there was a lot of post-production um involved and basically now we've gotten it to where we can do a lot of the recording live to where we're not like recording you know, on this camera with this view and then that camera and dealing with like SIM cards and, you know, like capturing the MIDI and then in post-production, like we're able to encode the video live because we have a really fast computer here. So that, that's been pretty big from a content perspective. And yeah. so back in the day, was it like Yannick with the, the camera, just like <laughs> recording you? Like that's what oh, I want yeah. to know. Like this is the fun stuff. How, how did it oh, yeah. Oh, I would just show up at Johnny's house when he was free, which was almost never. And then be like, all right, we, we didn't have the time. We didn't even know what we were going to shoot that day. So be like, play something. Okay, that's cool. Let's record a course on that. <laughs> and I, you know, stacked some books on the floor, get my tripod and be up there 
you know, taking that really is these. how it worked. That was how it worked in the beginning. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was so much fun. I always like, I felt, I knew it was what we were supposed to be doing. Cause I felt so excited. You know, right. I just, it was like the highlight of my week and yeah, we, like Johnny said, it was a lot of post-production, lots of painstaking editing and like adjusting frames and pulling my hair out. But I, you know, I just had to grip my teeth from time to time because I believed in what we were doing long term. And, um, and so we've just really found ways to make it more efficient. Um, and then also from the publishing side, you know, there's so many channels, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, now TikTok. Like, right. it's hard to keep up sometimes with how many ways there are to We lost them. The most consistent yeah. for us in terms of driving traffic. And a lot of that too is because of viral videos that Johnny's created. Sorry if my internet connection cut out. No, it's a little all bit good. There. It cut out, but keep going. Yeah. So uh, YouTube has been probably the strongest driver for us. And, uh, and I would say that Johnny's performances have also really inspired a lot of people and brought them to our lesson platform got a couple of viral videos the happy birthday in seven styles and mm -hmm. you know pop songs in ragtime that you'd never expect yeah that that was something really important that we did early on in the process of building our 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 business the education platform is just putting out regular weekly content and we did that it wasn't weekly at first but um just making a big priority out of that and putting out lots of videos and then our real growth in which really started in 2019 was actually putting up weekly content on our YouTube lesson channel. Um, and going back to your point about systems, like you can systematize content. Like something that really has worked for me is to find sort of themes or, or um, um, like formulas that I could recycle again and again. Like one of the video series that have done very well is the songs in ragtime. You should never play in ragtime. And yes, it's a lot of work to arrange the songs, but I have thousands of songs I can do this with. So once I discovered, okay, this really works, now I've got lots and lots of tunes. So it's really helpful to find formats that work that you can run with and spit out weekly contact, content as opposed to every week having to come up with something completely new. Totally, yep. Yeah, uh, rem I, I don't wanna lose a, a future thought about unique content, but you talked about consistency and I, I want to spend a little bit of time here because again, this is something that I've been a little bit more intentional in trying to communicate to our insider community, which is more like aspiring and, and early stage entrepreneurs, just trying to give them foundations like, Hey, and to your point, Yannick, like I am by no stretch of the imagination, a master of content. In fact, I think I'm really, really bad at it, but right now, I just hit play. I put the iPhone up. I hit play. I'm here. I have a little outline and I talk to it at some point. And like Kyle, who really manages our uh, true production workflow, like he's the, we have a system where he takes it and you know we have a playbook and he, he puts it into the things and makes it nice. Like I actually am removed from that other than recording and saying, here you go. Like, the, you know, that's the beginning of it. And I'm just part of that, the early part of that system. However, what I think is important to, to talk about here is the same way that it's two things. When you talked about the early way of like being on the tripod on the, on the chair, like you said it was fun and that's really important because if you're having fun as a creator, like, of course it doesn't feel like work, but you're going to be inspired to keep doing it. And that's one of the things I noticed to relate to your comment about recording content. Like, as a software engineer, it's not the most, it's arguable if it's even the highest leverage thing I should be doing as the CEO of my company. But, all, but more importantly, it is kind of fun, like just hitting record and genuinely sharing things that I think would be useful for people trying to build their businesses. I like that. Um, it's fun is, is a great word to describe it. Like unless I have to do tons of it, it doesn't drain me. It's kind of a, a nice shift from the everyday stuff. And I also think that a lesson here for anyone, especially in the earlier stages, is like you, you, you don't need to have 
the production value. And this is such a common, like we get questions a lot with new clients. They're like, where should I get my videos edited? Where should I do this? And like the way I answer that, I'm like, hit record, get your reps in, speak as if you're like truly trying to help someone. Because when you start overthinking it, like, how should I talk? What should I wear? Do I need flashy animations? Like you're going to, you're going to get stuck. Right. Would you guys agree with that? Because you put out a lot of content and started building a pretty good business with not a lot of production value. Is that a correct assumption? Sure. Well, and our production value is still fairly simple. Like mm -hmm. our videos are um, not 4K, they're HD. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have really expensive cameras. In fact, the camera, the overhead camera that we use to this day is the first overhead camera we ever bought. We bought this camera probably six years ago. It's an HD camera. It, it shoots beautifully. We probably spent 250 bucks on it. Mm -hmm. And it's the same camera we use because it works perfectly. I love it. Love so it. stuff like that. Um, you know, some of our competitors, they'll use like multi-camera angles and all this other stuff. But we, have, we keep it very simple. Like we have a side angle and an overhead angle. And that's what matters. Like people don't come to get all the angles. They come to have good piano instruction. Right. And so for years, actually, like one of our angles, you can actually see me on the screen. We didn't have me on the screen at all. So Yannick and I tried to be very thoughtful about like what matters the most, what's going to help the students the most, and then let everything else just be simple and leave it blank. Because then, you know, if you fill every aspect of the screen, screen with things that don't matter, then it takes away from what matters. It's a great point. It's a really good point. What else, just to kind of open this up, um, we're actually, in, in, if there, I, I was going to open this up, say, is there anything else you wanted to share that would be uh, related to like lessons learned? And again, just for people who are in the earlier stages who are either like, and, and you could speak to it if it is someone in your same space, like if they're like how you would talk to someone who's like, Hey, I want to teach drums online. Like, are there any lessons there that stand out? And if not, it's all good, but I'm just curious. Cause that's, that usually is something that's helpful for people. Yeah, definitely. One of the things that comes to mind for me is developing a strong community. I think that's something that Johnny and I have done really well online, you know, with Facebook groups and forums. It's like, once you get your students to, to not just be sort of passive users of your platform, but to be really active. And all, all, they almost kind of become like contributors. Like, yes, Johnny's our, the main teacher on our platform and we're bringing in other professionals, but kinds of friendships that have just organically developed in our community, I feel like are worth the, the admission to the platform alone. Like it's been really amazing to develop this very close knit, community i mean we think of it as a family to be honest yep um and it's so cool and, and we created that very deliberately like creating a very positive atmosphere um you know creating things to get people engaged because it's hard for students to like post videos of themselves and so you really need to give a lot of encouragement for people to do that right and um and there's that saying that people initially come for the content, but they stay for the community. Like they develop those friendships. Right. And one of the things Johnny and I really look forward to is doing, you know, once COVID is done and it's safe to socialize again, we would love to do an actual in-person event with like, who knows how many people would come, you know, maybe 50 or a hundred like to do a big piano convention. That would be so exciting. That would be awesome. So I think that's a, a big part, especially with running a membership, because when you're just selling courses, that's, you know, that's one thing. But when you have a membership, you're, res you're taking responsibility for the long-term success of the student. Mm -hmm. So not only are you creating new content each month to continue supporting them and doing Q&As and events, uh, but you're also trying to build relationships because in order to be successful with something, you need to learn from others, right? You need to feel like you're in this together. Um, sorry to throw another quote in there, but this is one I always share with Johnny. It's like, if you want to go fast, if you want to go far, go together. And I love you, you that. Cut out, I think I'm part of that. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, re reiterate that real quick. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't help myself. I love quotes, but it's, 
If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And we really live by that in our community. That one's big. Yeah, that one's really big. Because, and I'll be honest, like to, to kind of share some very open thoughts is that there are times where, um, because as you guys both know, being an entrepreneur has its advantages. There's also a lot of challenges. Like it's on you to perform and then you have a team to, to grow and you know, customers to serve, et cetera. And there are times where I'm like, I honestly think less now, but you know, I had a lot of these thoughts when I was, uh, in, in more frustrated places in life where I'd be like, this would just be easier if I just did it myself, get out of my way and I'm just going to go. And in early in my state career, as when I was more of a consultant, I did a lot of that and I went fast, really fast. But to your point, they, I'm, I'm becoming a pretty good, pretty big advocate that the best things in that we create as humans in this world are by groups of people like and it, it uh history repeats itself and shows that like if you look at the things that are accomplished it's always by teams like there's only a very select few of individuals the leonardo da vinci's of the world that like pulled things off by themselves and even those people did it with other people right you just don't know about it because they weren't talked about but they had the apprentices they had the support systems in place so i think that's a great quote is that you know sure you go fast but just do it by yourself and then eventually um to finish that quote out you're gonna fizzle out you're gonna burn out you're gonna run out of gas whereas like if you want to go far i think that's you're absolutely right you have to do it with with a group so thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that the reminder is helpful yeah what else any other big lessons if not we're going to shift into the last big topic, which is balancing family life with business. Sure. Yeah, I can speak to some things that are lessons. I, I think were really helpful for Yannick and me. And something I see a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with is this concept of like, um, when you're first getting started and you don't have very much money and you're like, well, I've got to hire this and I've got to hire that person. And I've got to, you know, and it's like really overwhelming. You know, Yannick and I, we learned thing, we learned like video editing. We didn't know anything about it. Right. I learned how to use Photoshop. We learned how to run a WordPress website. And so it's interesting. We're talking about, you know, getting your team and all of that, which is really important. But at first, you don't have very much money. Right. And you don't have proof of concept. You don't know if it's going to be success. So you don't want to dump a ton of money into it. And so there's this concept in business called Lean Startup. And that's um, part of Lean Startup is is testing ideas, but doing things very lean and doing things, you know, bootstrapping it. So I think for all of your listeners, if they want to start their, if you want to start your own business, learn the different facets of your business. I think Ali, you're one of the first people that we hired because I didn't want to learn how to code a website. Um, and we had the resources, the resources to do that. So um, I think it's very important to learn um, new things that are uncomfortable. Um, another thing that has helped me a lot in the business is to not get too focused on the metrics and the numbers. It's really easy to go on an emotional roller coaster ride of putting out a YouTube video and you know one does really well and then five don't do very well. And it's it's really easy to get down and to want to quit. Um, I have probably <laughs> wanted to quit this business like dozens and dozens and dozens of times because there were times things got really hard and so it will be hard but i would focus all of your i would encourage all of your listeners not to focus too much on the numbers mm -hmm. um it's taken us eight years to get work to where we're at mm -hmm. and so things will not launch right away um there's another quote i think you mentioned yannick and i love this quote that we um we over we overestimate what we can do in a you know a month but we underestimate what we can do in five years and so that has really rung true for us it's just being consistent and being in it for the long the long term and keeping the vision of of what you believe in because five years into this you know we we didn't have that vision um realized and i think we're now really starting to hit that point so be be very patient yannick is a you have a book of quotes you want to share with us these just keep <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah i think what johnny said is really important um and, and to at the same time like do keep an eye on, you know, certain numbers, like, you know, your, your business, like your key sort of metrics that you can see your improvements over time. Yep. 
uh, your churn rate and those kinds of things, because um, that's important. But don't, as far as like publishing content and one thing did well and another thing didn't get any views, right. you don't want to get so emotionally attached to that, like Johnny said. And um, yeah, I, I think that's uh, a great point, Johnny. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good point. In fact, I have a, some interesting perspective on that that we can discuss together is that in early, when I was a very, very early entrepreneur, I had no understanding of numbers beyond closing new deals and th there's revenue and I'm living and I'm fine, right? And there's early in my mentorship of, of you know, being coached and growing through business, I started to understand KPIs, which you're talking about, right? So what are the KPIs of the business? What do we track? And I even got to a place as I really started leveling up where I got very goal focused. Interestingly enough, after being in different businesses and selling businesses, I'm, I'm actually starting to let go of goals. And it, it's also an experimentation framework is that I found that, so I'm not saying goals aren't good because they are good. It's just your relationship with goals. And so to, to give more in, uh, insight context to that is that I had, was at a point a while ago where the goal itself was determining my happiness, whereas now I, I've flipped it. And I've said, whether or not we reach this ambiguous goal is going to happen, you know, based on the, the decisions and the actions that we make as, as a business, whereas I would rather just wake up happy every day. And then if I realize that goal, Awesome, because then I'm controlling my everyday environment, my everyday intentions, etc. Whereas that's that's one of the things I've learned personally that I'll share. Like if you get super goal focused, and like Johnny, like both of you mentioned, like you start to play the numbers game, you have to prepare that if you don't hit those numbers, it will it can drastically affect you as a mm -hmm. entrepreneur, as a human, as a as a anything. And so. I think what I, where, how we're looking at uh, just kind of KPIs right now as a team at MemberDev is that kind of like the bite size is like, we just want to look for progression. Like we don't necessarily need to hit these rigorous revenue milestones that I used to set, but instead it's like, are we improving? Like are the processes getting better? Are we growing as a company? Are our customers growing? Because to me, that helps us keep that more uh, consistent happiness and fulfillment instead of being controlled by that goal. Cause that's where I got into some kind of deep dark places where I'm like, mm, miss the goal. And then you start playing all these mind games, you know? Right. Yeah. Sometimes the goal or hitting those goals is not indicative of the quality of what you're doing. Um, I think for a long time, Yannick and I were trying out things that weren't paying off. And then finally they started to pay off, but initially it was like, well, we're not hitting those big numbers. You know, these viral videos can be so mis, um, uh, they don't, they don't really reveal what matters. Sure. Sometimes we can even cheapen what we, our products and what we offer by them. So I think the, the main thing is to have something you really believe in and then be really consistent and true to that. And, you know, and, and the thing is like, Yannick and I, we, we didn't, we haven't built a Tesla, you know, or an Amazon. It, it's actually very niche what we're doing. We're teaching the jazz and blues and improv. Um, but we've been able to build a really nice business out of it because you have the world at your fingertips. So totally. I think that's another thing to keep in mind. You don't need to build a massive company to create value for people. Um, pick something you believe in, focus on a, a niche audience and make really good content or whatever you're doing. And I think over time, if you believe in that and you keep adjusting, you keep growing over time, you'll find that you'll strike gold in a sense. You'll, you'll find that perfect. I love it, man. I love it. Let, let's also, uh, before we finish this thought, talk a little about consistency. Cause that's a, that's another thing that I try to share with people. I even struggle with it. Like, cause like I said, I'm, I'm experimenting with content creation a lot right now. And I find myself missing a day where I scheduled like what just bare bones, like what are your systems? Because I, th when I look at your guys success from a third party perspective, I'm like, Oh, they were consistent. Just like you said, they kept pumping out content They kept creating courses. They built the YouTube channel. Whereas a lot of times failure or absence of reaching specific goals comes from just forgetting to be consistent or laying off. So what would be your, what would be your advice 
for people to stay consistent. Cause that's it. They hear it all the time. Do it every month, you know, post the stuff, but we don't do it. And most humans don't do it. So what would be your advice there on consistency? Sure. Yeah. I mean, a big thing is scheduling. So I, I make all of our YouTube videos. Um, well, I'm now adding another video to the mix, but I have a schedule on Monday. I do a performance video. I put that on one channel and then I do a quick tip on Tuesday. Um, we do, um, a daily, a little daily practice, one minute tip. I shoot it the week before every month. So, um, it's, it's just, I think a big thing is creating a setup that's really comfortable to record in. It's easy to record in. Like this is a setup that's so easy to record in. I literally click one button and it's, it's like done. So putting yourself in an environment that it's, it's smooth. And then, is it all in the calendar? You just mentioned schedule. Like, do you have a calendar where all this is there? Yeah, I do. I do put it in my calendar. Yep. And I, every single day I wake up and I, before I start working, I say, here's the top, you know, three or five things that I want to get done. Cool. Um, and then, yeah, for me, it's, it's just been like riding through certain seasons where, you know, content doesn't do well. Like, uh, you know, we've had times on the YouTube channel where like, oh my gosh, you know, it was like really explosive, I think early on, maybe 2016. And then there was like a lull for like two years. So it was like nothing. And then we had this big, you know, boost again in 2019. And then it was like a lull again. So you just have to ride through and despite content not doing well, I say, I'm going to make content this week. And I can't tell you how many times I've made content and not felt like it, you know, having a crappy day or I'm feeling right. a little under the weather and I, I just still make the video. And sometimes it's weird. Sometimes that was my best content. Yeah. So I think you have to trust that you're going to land where you want. Um, and then, yeah, just, I mean, a lot of it comes to like self-discipline and, you know, are there other areas of your life that you're not disciplined in? Maybe, I mean, I've found like, even diet, if I just get in control of my eating, then suddenly I'm more consistent in all these other areas. So I think being a whole person, you know, for your listeners, you know, look at your overall life. How disciplined are you in those ways? If you're not in other areas, how are you going to be disciplined with, with that, with content? Yeah. And also to, because it's interesting, like, I really appreciate what Johnny said about doing it, even when you don't feel inspired or motivated to do it, just because you've made that commitment to yourself and to your audience um yeah i think there's a sense of like responsibility to the people that you know have trusted you to be their teacher um that gives kind of a fuel and energy to keep going but if you don't have that yet um and if you're a person that isn't naturally very disciplined or consistent i think it's important to ride that wave of inspiration when it comes because it's easy to get like really inspired and excited yes and even to, like start planning goals but you don't actually do anything real like you don't create any real work and then you're like oh, okay i'll get and then next week you don't really feel like doing it anymore so that's been something for me it's like when i feel that inspiration i i have to take action right in that moment you know and and write like i do a lot of our email um, automations like our campaigns I did a lot of writing for those and like I just had to fill myself with inspiration and then just write 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 you know and sometimes I would go for like six hours non-stop and I'd still want to keep going you know but uh, component to it is like fill yourself with inspiration uh, mm. and act on it that's huge yep that's huge I've been practicing that as well where um, when you feel inspired, go do it. Because to Johnny's point, I think there's a lot of value in a schedule and being consistent, showing up, putting the reps in. That's honestly why most people fail is that they just don't put the time in, right? The 10,000 hour rule, Malcolm Gladwell, however you want to look at it. It's that have you, did you commit and did you put the time in? But then there's this piece you're talking about, Yannick, which is powerful where when you feel inspiration, you need to go act on it. Because You'll never, you'll probably never produce as good of um, content or even just impact the world as when you're inspired to take action. And I think that's, that's really valuable. It also lends to what Johnny says, like, make sure you have a comfortable environment so that if you do feel inspired, like, boom, you can just go over there, record something. I, it's funny you guys mentioned that because there's been times where 
I've been on a, uh, I'm very disciplined with, with health and fitness. And in the warmer months, I run almost every day. And there's been a few times in the last few months where I've been running and hearing a podcast and I'm like, oh my goodness, that what they said, I have to stop. And I've recorded a quick little clip for our insider community because of this exact point. It's like, I don't want to lose that thought. I need to talk about this now, you know? Right. Okay. Awesome stuff. Let's wrap a few more minutes. Let's just talk about family life balance. Maybe not a few as, as, as long as it takes. The idea is that um, every entrepreneur at some point has to deal with work-life balance, work-life integration, however you label the term. Um, for me, this has been huge. And I'll speak to this after you guys, but I want to know a little bit about family life versus business because you both have families and maybe that's what you do. You can each tee up a really quick intro and then spend a few minutes talking about how you juggle that and, and the, this, the challenges, the rewards, et cetera. Who wants to go first? Well, you have sure. two kids. I only have one Yannick, so you can go first. All right. Yannick's first. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So my wife and I became parents almost two years ago. We became foster parents and uh, we took in two kids, ages three and uh, five at the time. And so now they're six, five. And so it's been such a learning opportunity to run a business and to prioritize being a, which is extremely important to me. Um, and Johnny as well. And it's, it's challenging at times because, you know, I, I created this business with Johnny and I care passionately about the work we do and our member community. And sometimes I kind of have an obsessive mind. And when I'm trying to solve a problem, I can really get in that headspace. Um, and I've had to learn very deliberately to turn my working mind off and to create a clear distinction. So for me, the family time is non-negotiable at this point. Like when you have kids, you know, those moments are so precious with them for them to learn new words and to, you know, first time riding the bike, um, just all those beautiful joy um, of seeing your child grow. And I don't want to miss a second of that. So, you know, during the weekends, I've had to teach myself, nope, I'm not going to check that email. I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to worry about it. I'll get to it on Monday. And I think our business has done better as a result of making those very clear rules for myself because you're, you're more efficient and you're more driven when you are on the job. You have to get that stuff done so that I can be 100% with my family when I'm home. So yeah, that's, those are some of my lessons and insights on that. Are you working less now that you have two daughters? Yes. Yeah. And Johnny and I have had recent conversations about that. It's just, I work the regular hours, you know, I work full time and that's enough. I don't need to put in crazy 60 hour weeks like I used to, you know, I mean, I, and, and that's not to say that if you're just getting started, you have to work crazy hours. I mean, I know a lot of people listening probably already have out with their first ideas and yeah you you don't want to burn yourself out you really need to take it sustainably um and yeah i think johnny and i have had recent conversations about this and for us it's like yeah we really like family time is non-negotiable for us i love it i love that yeah yeah, something that helped me tremendously with this, this has always been really challenging for me, but um, kind of Tionic's point is creating separation between the, the work and the home life. Um, you know, for a while I was working out of, uh, of, of a bedroom at home, and I think one of the real transformations was just getting a, an office space and then having that separation. I was way more focused at work, and then when I was home, I was way more focused with my kiddo. Yep. Um, the hard part for me, and it is still challenging, I still have to keep this in check, is, you know, like our Facebook, our member community is on Facebook. And so <laughs> you log into Facebook, you know, even for personal reasons, then you see all of the member posts. And so it's easy to sort of get sucked in, um, and, and to be honest, point with email as well. So 
just getting rid of the cell phone or the smartphone and not having it um, too close when I'm with the family. Um, and then, yeah, I think to Yannick's point as well, you don't need to put in 60 or 70 hours a week to build a sustainable business. Um, and you can work, you know, a, a regular work week. And that's something I've, it's taken me a while to realize, but putting in that extra hour or two, um, oftentimes has diminishing returns mm -hmm. and it takes away from your energy the next day. So um, it's doing really good work, consistent work and balance that has helped us. And I think a big reason we're, we are where we are today is because Yannick and I have been able to balance those, those various needs. Do you guys turn it off though? Like when you start talking about separation, like do you turn it off? Like turn the smartphone off? No, do you turn the business off means get out of your head. Like, right. can, you, can you truly turn it off? Because this is where the conversation comes, um, where I've been listening to both sides for many years and, and I can share a little bit about my perspective, but like there's work-life balance, which is like, yo, I turn it off. After five, I walk out of the studio, I left that in there. I'm not dealing with that anymore. It's off my mind. I'm gonna go run, throw my kids around, have dinner, have a conversation with my wife, et cetera. Then there's work-life integration, which is a bit more like they just blend and I accept that they blend and I let them blend harmoniously. Like in my father's mastermind, we talk, a lot of people subscribe to that and they're like, if I'm such a high performer in business, why wouldn't I apply some of that stuff to family life? And it's interesting when you explore like, oh yeah, the, these systems I put in my business, like I could literally bring these into my family and we can become a, so I'm curious to hope that gives some context. Do you guys see it as balanced and you turn it off or are you still kind of integrating things? Yeah, I guess it, it's both for me. I, I can't really stop thinking about the business on the weekends. I think if I'm in the shower, if I'm driving, I'm thinking about, but for me, I'm excited by it. So it's so hard to like squelch that. And, and like, if I feel guilty about it, it's like, wait a second, like this, lights me up like i'm so excited about what we're doing with our new studio space and so that's a really good space to be in is if it, i think is to be mindful of how you're approaching those thoughts if it's like oh like how am i going to solve this thing or oh man how are we going to deal with that thing then that's probably not a good space but if you're like man i can't like i can't get this out of my head i think that's a good place to be in and i think it will you know if you have that kind of energy on the weekends i think it's a great thing to bring into your family life and to share with your spouse, like I was sharing with, you know, my wife, Crystal, the other day, and, you know, and it, it really makes us more bonded because she gets right. to participate in that, so. I dig it. What about you, Yannick? Yeah, I, I agree totally. I think if there are certain big decisions on the horizon, it's not like I just turn that off. Um, and sometimes I'll get some of my best ideas talking to my wife or my kids, you know, kids are such great out of the box thinkers. You know, they're, uh, yeah, they're, they're great sources of inspiration. Um, so, but yeah, as far as what you were saying, that was an interesting point about taking sort of some of the principles of running a business and thinking of like how you would apply that to your family dynamic. I, I haven't thought about that too in depth, but I guess, you know, if, if there's something I've learned in running a business, it's that it makes you more deliberate about how you use your time, right? You're not just trying to fill hours. Like you're really deliberate about what, what are you trying to create and what are you trying to offer to people? And I think we, we deal a lot in, you know, as the founders of our companies and thinking of like our vision and what we're, what impact we're trying to have think about that all the time with my family and, you know, the, the things that I can offer them and how I want to, um, just the kind of father I want to be and how I want them to see the world and grow up and the things that I learned from them, which I learn new things every day. So mm -hmm. yeah, in that regard, absolutely. Yep. I'm with you. It's, I think that, well, to, to kind of uh, build upon some of these thoughts is that it is as an entrepreneur, it's hard to turn it off. And if there was one thing I'd have to point at that I feel like I'm just constantly always trying to master with the slowest amount of progression, it's that. And I've, I've come to realize it's all in my head. And regardless of how you feel about 
spirit, spirituality, neuroscience, all the things that I'm generally becoming more and more educated on, it is all up in our head. Like, and this goes back to what you said, Yannick, about checking the phone. Like, I'm really disciplined with the phone. I don't even know where my phone is right now, honestly. And to the point where like my family and friends get mad because I don't text them back, you know, and it's because I've removed that. My phone has no notifications. I use it to call people. I don't check anything on it minus like text messages and things that can still get to me because I found that one, like I decide when to use the phone as opposed to the phone using me, which is what I think it's doing when you allow all these notifications, you're just reacting. Right. Yep. And to your double thumbs up, like emails the same way. Like Yannick mentioned, I don't check email anymore, especially at nights and weekends, because I know as I'm continuing to like control my, my mind, like one email, just opening that email and reading it can throw me off. And now whatever state I was in, I'm now thinking about this, you know, right. and, if, and the wrong email can really mess with your day. So I think that some of the, the takeaways here, regardless of how you think about work-life balance, work-life integration, are like just really being mindful of when you're in work mode and when you're not, because it is very hard to Johnny's point to, and to your point as well, to like turn it off. Like it's just a part of our lives. We run businesses which effectively, you know, run our life, you know, uh, afford our lifestyle. And so to like just get rid of that is a really, like you almost have to become a monk in a way to like just get get that thing out of your head because it just, it's ingrained in you. Whereas it's, it's a lot easier to say, I want to be in charge of when I'm in business mode. Because what I was sharing with you guys earlier is actually very much my day is that, you know, right around five o'clock, you can ask my wife, like I shut down, whatever I was working on stays here. And then I go into family mode and I have fun and I don't deal with work again until the next morning when I decide to go in and do it. Mm -hmm. And it, the other point that Johnny made is like the, I have had offices for our team and then I, we just got rid of it because of the pandemic. Whereas I have found that useful too, because when I had an office, it would give me that transition time. Like, okay, I'm checking out. I've got this 30 minutes on the train to clear my thoughts, listen to a podcast or something. Whereas one of the struggles here is like, I just step out the door and my son's like, let's build Legos dad. Where have you been? And I, it is like, I kind of have, I need some time to, push that, that stuff aside, the business, you know what I'm saying? Right. Right. But, but I love that you guys are, what I really want to love and, and kind of end on is that you're sharing that there, especially as it relates to family life. Cause we, we have a lot of entrepreneurs who, who have families and that's a big, it's a big game changer in just being a solo entrepreneur. Like it is a very different world as you both know. And I, what you're saying, and I'm sort of agreeing to is that, when you prioritize your family, you learn to do more in less time, right? Because you're like, Hey, I only have these many hours. Like I'm checking out at five. And so in a way, even though it feels like, Oh, I used to be able to do 60 and now I've got 30 ish, 40, like you're, I've kind of learned that I'm actually getting more done. Cause I'm more productive. Is that, mm -hmm. is that kind of how you guys have felt about it as well? Yeah, definitely. My time has become way more valuable than it used to. I'm more, like before I could throw away an hour, a couple hours, but like every minute matters now because the opportunity cost is so much greater. I've got, I've got a little kiddo, you know, I've got my wife, I've got, and so it's a, it's a beautiful thing because it also comes down to self-esteem. You know, I think when I was in my twenties, it's like, oh, I don't, you know, my time, whatever it's not, you know, it's, but as you get older, you have less time and it also, I don't know you for me i've picked the people who matter the most i have a very small small group of really close friends and i have my priorities it's my family and it's piano with johnny and it's very simple uh, in many ways but totally yeah i think it, it's it's been good it's helped me simplify and really pick the people and the things that matter the most you agree with that Yanni? absolutely yeah <clears throat> I think that with um, yeah with kids, just the sense of responsibility to them and the quality of time is so precious, and that is the most precious resource, right? Time we can never get it back, yep. and so yeah, you're you're never gonna you know 
be, time's never going to pass and you're going to look back and think, oh, I wish I would have spent more time working on my business, right? You're, you're going to think about your kids and, and the way that they're going to remember you and nothing takes the place of that quality time. So yeah, I, always, I always think about that. And, um, and I appreciate you, Ali, for sharing that commitment with us too. And you, know, you, you talk a lot about this with us, Front Row Dads, uh, you know, as a group that you've told us about. And yeah, I'm glad that we're on the same page about that. And I hope everyone listening you know, takes that to heart. Um, because if you think about it too, like I think this is related to what Johnny was saying about self-esteem. I think it's easy for us to attach our worth to our work. And at the end of the day, your, your family cares more about just the type of person you are with them. So sometimes you might not have hit your career aspirations yet or financial aspirations, but don't let that detract from the way that you want to be with your family because they care a lot more about the type of person you are and, and the quality of your spirit than the amount of money in your bank account. hundred mm, percent. Yeah. One hundred percent. No, that's big. <laughs> That, that's such a beautiful note to follow on. Yeah. And you're right. Like we are, we're family first around here. I have trouble even telling our customers how we can support them on the weekends. Cause honestly, I don't want to, I want everyone to unplug, including our customers. I realize it's not the case because we support e-commerce businesses, but it is, uh, it's one of, it's one of my temperature checks since I still run sales over here. Is that like, if I get a sense of someone where I'm like, Oh, you, well, I'll, I'll share this. I ask people if they have families now and it's not because I'm judging, but it's because there's a lot of pre-context I can do knowing that. And then there's been rare occasions. We've, we've been fortunate to work with a lot of great people like you all, but there's been rare occasions where I've fired clients because of the way that they've prioritized work. And that's just not our game. Like we just don't play that game here. Some people play that and that's totally fine. But I hope that this last piece we've talked on, which we're ending on, resonates with people because that's totally the game I want to play it's also the, the game that I like coaching people like I've, I've been reading a lot on conscious leadership um, this is the area that I you know I can give value to our clients in terms of business strategy but there's a lot about conscious leadership and just being like really in tune with um, like I said balance integration however you, you uh, coin this to, that will that will yield even greater success than just hitting numbers. So mm-hmm. I think it's a beautiful place to end. Thank you both so much. This has been awesome. Um, I know people are going to get value from this. I appreciate you sharing your story. Is there anything you wanted to close with? And it, there doesn't have to be. <laughs> Yannick, one more quote. You got, you got one more <laughs> No. It's oh, all, let's see. Yeah. Yes, you do. Do you? I'll, I'll think of one. Yeah. I'll think we'll, of one. We'll put it on, on the post. That, that, that'll be a good way to wrap it up. But I, I, yeah. I have one thing to share. I think it'll be helpful for your listeners is I think you probably have a lot of listeners who have a great idea and they feel ready to explode, but they're just, they don't know what to do. They're, they're paralyzed. They're stuck. What, do I do this? Do I do this? Start the YouTube, YouTube channel. Do I go on this U- Udemy to make it, or do I go on this website? So, so many decisions. And I think the best advice I could give you is just do one thing. Mm-hmm. Just one thing. Okay. And then when that's done, do one more thing. Don't try to knock it all out. Literally just putting one foot in front of the other a million times has gotten us to where we are today. Do you read that? Have you read that book? No. What the one thing? That? Okay. It's beautiful what you're saying because it's very in line with, with what they promote, which is yeah. a best selling book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, it's true. It's, it's part of the nature. We, we can't as humans uh, really focus on multiple things at the, th- at the same time. But the thing is, is you just do it so many times that eventually right. you look back and, oh my gosh, I've scaled this mountain. And so that's just the key is just take one thing at a time and make a decision. Don't get paralyzed pick something and go and it, it might not be the best option but thankfully in business you know it's it's a little more forgiving actually than the piano if you hit the wrong note with the piano yeah you know it sounds horrible but if you in business you can you can um you can collect yourself and go in a new direction yannick and i've made plenty of, of wrong decisions and so uh, but make a decision don't get stuck in the analysis paralysis love it yeah well it really overlaps with like 
the way we think as musicians, like I had a great colleague at a school where I worked <clears throat> and she always said, dare to suck. You know, we use the term failing forward. Like I love those little reminders that it's not about perfection in the beginning. It's just about creating something and then because that's the only way to learn, right? Michael Jordan, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. There it is. That's my closing quote. Closing <laughs> I know you're a Jordan fan, Ali. I love MJ, especially, yeah. I lo- Thank you. Okay, guys, this has been fantastic. Um, I appreciate you both, and we will talk again soon. All Thanks, right? Ali. We appreciate you. Thanks, Ali.